at the beginning of the year it is as well to pause for time is running out. In Selignac it was the duty of Don Gista, who was also a professor in theology, every week to do a big physical exercise. And he explained that it put one in sweat, so we all sueur. He had to go to the huge old clock, which functions as old clocks do, manually, and get it moving again for another week. It meant a huge operation of winding up this weight, big weight, from the bottom of the thing right up to the top, and it would go down one notch at a time over the next seven days, reminding us each time it's a little bit towards eternity. And life is like that. We take time for granted until it is no more. Who knows who of our friends will not be here this time next year. It's a big mystery. And then and only then do we sometimes realize how much they meant to us. So for you little people, be aware of that. Don't take Daddy and Mammy for granted. They won't always be there. It's when they've gone that we sometimes hit ourselves. I wish I'd been more grateful and not taken them so for granted. But with regard to the wider picture, I'd like for a few seconds to pause. We get quite a few reports from people who have been there and back nowadays. People who die and by modern means are resuscitated. And they have all kinds of things to say, but usually there's something a bit similar, at least in the initial stages. The soul does come out of the body and does perceive things without the body at that point, and far more clearly. And precisely because there's no more distraction, they see all as it is. The truth, their truth. And then it is they see what their state is. And it is well at this beginning of the year to be aware of that. Take stock. If I were to die and I look into myself, what is my state, if I'm honest? Am I ready? If not, what has to be done that I may be? And I picked into this this morning because I've been looking at the whole question of angels and I was fascinated to find an answer to my big question about what happened to the angels. As you know, before time, they were given a moment of time to decide all time. Their test. We're given a whole life full and we can come back on our decision. They can't. They're fixed because they knew everything at that point. And you know what happened. The brightest of them all rebelled and was trying to get them all. But the question of St. Michael, who is important to us, we invoke him quite a lot, I think, all of us. And I was quite puzzled, was he amongst the highest lot, or was he in one of the lower choirs? And it's a bit puzzling, because actually, if one looks at the nine choirs, the archangels come immediately after the angels, and they appear doing things on earth, which means they're not exclusively absorbed with gazing on the divinity, which is the role of the seraphim and the cherubim. They are exclusively contemplative. These are, in that sense, real angels. An angel is a messenger, that's what it means. And they're doing things. Michael appears, Raphael appears, Gabriel appears. So, it would seem they're on our side. And some say that Gabriel was the angel given to a blessed lady as her personal guardian angel. It's possible, we don't know. Certainly he was very much present in her life. It's also the angel, apparently, who appeared to the shepherds. That's interesting. Now, that would imply, therefore, that they're mobile. Now, this actually answered my puzzlement this morning. And it's linked with what I picked up while reading about exorcism. How, in one big, powerful exorcism, the exorcist 
was trying to get out who was in there, they have to do that, that's one of the early stages they have to do, that gives them certain authority over them when they know their name. And it was coming out that it was, that it was Beelzebul in there, and he was trying to find out why it wasn't Lucifer. And it turned out, because the devil was answering, that he was there by the command of Lucifer. And so it, there was a whole dialogue which then sussed out there was therefore obedience under them, and Lucifer of course was the big boss, but in reverse. And it's perfect obedience, the wrong way round. But then the question was, these big ones, where were they? Where had they been? What did they belong to? Which order? Which choir? And it turned out, yes, they had belonged to the choir of Seraphim, closest to the lock, and that would explain why they had this temptation to pride. They were brilliant, the most brilliant. So they thought they'd get their own kingdom. So this question then Michael, what happened? He, it seems, was given greater power. There was this cosmic battle. And this came out in the manuscript I translated from the French, the Purgatory Manuscript, when St. Michael is coming and going in there. He has a lot to do with purgatory and with death. Listen to this, great and small, and in between. We see St. Michael, says the soul who has died, as one sees, in inverted commas, angels. He hasn't a body. He comes to purgatory to fetch all the souls which have been purified. He's the one who leads them to heaven. And by the way, in another passage in this long diary, it comes out also that she had this encounter. She saw her own guardian angel immediately after death, and she also saw St. Michael, who was present at the execution, as it were, of the sentence, and, and sort of led them. So she already had that encounter at her death. But she goes on here at this point. Yes, it's true, she says. He's among the seraphim, as Monsignor said. He is the first of the angels in heaven. Now, it could be that that was a development of this cosmic battle, because we know he was given greater power and he hadn't been the greatest of all angels until then. Our guardian angels come to see us too. Now, do you think that a guardian angel is not interested in the person that that angel has been looking after all his life? person's life and the angel's only ward, because that angel will never be given to another person. There's a huge number of angels, an infinite number, a massive number of angels. We can't imagine the number. Therefore, it's not surprising that there's no repetition. They only have one soul to look after, so they're very interested in that soul. And what would be their pain if that soul is lost? But they're completely wedded to the divine will, so they don't feel, as we would, that same grief. They're in the hands of God but they've tried their level best. But just think, when they see that soul, they've tried to help all those years go the wrong way. It's something we can't imagine. He is the first of the angels in heaven. Our guardian angels come to see us too. That's in purgatory now. But St. Michael is so much more beautiful than they. As for the Blessed Virgin, we see her with her body. She comes to purgatory on her feast days, notice that, and returns to heaven with many souls. While she is with us, our suffering stops. St. Michael comes with her, now she's called the Queen of Angels, so whether she's about to be a whole horde of angels, throng of angels, whatever the Blessed Virgin is. But when he's on his own, our sufferings continue as usual. And then she goes on about these different degrees. When I spoke to you of the, the Grand Purgatory, the Grand Purgatoire, and of the Second Purgatory, it was in order to make you understand. What I meant by that was that there are different degrees in Purgatory. Thus, I call Grand Purgatory the place in which I found those souls which are most guilty. And it seems, and it, this comes out elsewhere in the manuscript, that some are there who shouldn't really be there. They should be further down, you know what that means. But the Lord has done all he possibly could, possibly through somebody's prayer not to let that happen. He does his level best at death to do something that a soul may have a chance. And Maria Sima says there's a moment in time between really the irreversible and this life. We've, we're losing them, but she maintains, and she knows what she's talking about obviously, that there's a borderline, a kind of no man's land at death in which they're given this last grace this last chance, in such a way that if at that point they still refuse, then okay, they're fully aware of what they're doing. 
It's a tremendous thing. All eternity is in the balance in a few seconds, really. She goes into this roughly two, at the maximum, three minutes. There's that kind of gray area. We're losing contact ourselves, but the Lord is very much at work, it seems, at that point. When we think about it, it makes sense. All eternity has to be decided at some point. And if we've been distracted all our life, that point is pretty important. So, those who are most guilty, where I remained for two years, and she wasn't able to ask for help for anything at that period, without being able to give any sign of my torments, and then the year in which you heard my complaints, you know that I was still there when I began to speak to you. In the second purgatory, which is still purgatory, albeit different from the first, one's suffering is still great, but smaller than in the first. Last of all is a third place, the purgatory of desire. So at that point, the burning out of the pain of the sense, because the spiritual sense has to, as it were, pay back what it's robbed from the order of creation. An illicit pleasure is paid back. And it's called the pain of the sense. At that point, there's only the pain of loss left, the desire. But it's intense because they're purified now and they only want God. They're made for God. The soul cannot be satisfied without what it's not made for. That's where I am at present. So that's why these last bits are very interesting. She's warning her how to avoid what leads to any kind of purgatory. And it's very important. They're nuns, and therefore they've got all the graces. In these three purgatories, there are many degrees. So even within this, it's all unequal. As the soul is progressively purified, it does not say suffer the same torments. Everything is proportioned to the thoughts it has to expiate. So just to understand, we don't know what's beyond the veil. But it's a very real world. And this beginning of the year is perhaps a moment to pause and think. The massive majority of humanity is on the other side. Only a tiny fraction is on this side compared with how many souls are on the beyond. That's the big human family. They're all out there waiting for us to get there. And all our existence seems to be, it's all for the immediate, the immediate, the immediate, even the immediate goal in football, which has no value whatsoever compared with this, which is the real issue which will never, ever go away.